Hi, oh, good afternoon. It's, uh, it's Simon here from RPG Geek. Um, I've got Aloy Lasanta and his Dunker with me for a panel on uh, how to hire artists. Um, before I get going, perhaps I could uh, just let people know that if you look at the left of your screen, you can see um, a little Q&A button. If you click on that Q&A button, um, you'll be able to actually ask questions live to Liz and Aloy. Um, if you do that, I can see the questions that have come up, and I can ask them myself, um, and hopefully they'll be able to answer your questions. Uh, but before we get going, then, could I please ask the two of you to introduce yourself? Perhaps, um, Aloy, if you could start, please, by giving us a little bit of background about yourself and uh, what your role is in the industry. Sure. Um, well, my name is Aloy Lasanta, and I'm uh, the owner of Third Eye Games. Uh, so we make a, a lot of different RPGs. We make uh, Apocalypse Prevention, Inc. We make Wishing the Ninja Crusade, Part-Time Gods, uh, as well as uh, Mermaid Adventures, uh, Camp Myth, and the new Sinister that's out now, and a bunch of other things that are in the works. Um, so we've been working in the industry for about five years, and um, I've had to work with a lot of artists since then, um, and I've had to hire lots of different artists, and that has had good and bad outcomes <laughs> in both cases. So, um, uh, so yeah, I've been doing it for a while, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. Okay, well, it's quite useful to have um, the two of you on different sides of the fence, really, isn't it? Because uh, the lawyer did the hiring. Liz, you're the artist, so could you give us a bit of background about yourself, please? Actually, I have been on both sides of the fences for a yeah. great deal of time as well. Um, I go back into the dawn of time when the earth was cooling. Dinosaurs are still wandering around in the mid-70s is when I got into the industry. Um, I, <laughs> tunnels and Trolls, yes. That is indeed one of the uh, early projects I worked on. That's a, What is that, about a second edition almost? No, not that late, well, not that early, early, but... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, uh, uh, I have been illustrating... Uh, since the mid late 70s, and um, uh, worked for everything from FASA and Traveler uh, and DD when it was still with TSR. I did editing for TSR. I obviously um, worked with Tunnels and Trolls and Flying Buffalo. Uh, I was, for seven years, I was the art director and productions director at Buffalo, which is why I was on that side of the fence, hiring people as well as working freelance. Um, in the intervening years, I've done everything from computer game storyline design. I worked on the Wasteland um, computer game that Brian Fargo kickstarted last year uh, because I worked on the original Wasteland back in the day. Uh, the Tunnels and Trolls Deluxe TNT is my current project on the books, and um, uh, I just completed. They're just on the verge of releasing um, the Gathering, which is the Magic: The Gathering. That's what really raised my visibility in the industry uh, when Magic came out, and I was one of the early artists working on that project. Okay, so you. You worked on Magic the Gathering. How long, did you, how long were you uh, doing that for? I did that. Um, I did about 50 cards in the early sets, everything from Alliances and uh, Ice Age. And, and as late as, God, I can't remember the names of the expansions, but in, I think the last time I did Magic cards was probably about 2002, 2004. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, I don't do I do more quirky esoteric style than is common in the cards now. The work is beautiful. I still have many friends doing magic cards, uh, but my style doesn't fit uh, anymore. But uh, I was one of the early ones that started it off. Okay, well it's a pleasure to to meet you anyway. Um, perhaps we just start with um, some questions about some um, hiring artists. Then, Aloy, perhaps I can start with you. Um, I've got a question here from Keith, who's asked me to ask you, um, the quality of the art aside, um, if you're a, pr a prospective buyer, um, what should you consider important when you, you're negotiating a contract with an artist? What should I consider important? Yeah. Hmm. Um, I mean, okay, so quality of the artwork. I mean, because uh, you're right, we should throw the quality of the artwork 
out of the window because it's assumed that I like it, otherwise I'm not negotiating. Yeah. Uh, so, um, the, I mean, the first thing that I always do is, is I always consult my budgets. I mean, you have to kind of go after who you can afford to get. Um, if you only have a certain amount of money that you have for a book, then you say, hey, um, Mr. or Mrs. Artist, um, I have this much money. How many pieces can I get for this? Or can we work out a deal or something like that? I mean, it, it's actually, you know, in hiring, hiring an artist is actually, it's a pretty fluid kind of experience. It's not really, it does, it's not really a, here's my contract, take it or leave it a lot of the time. A lot of, you know, sometimes it's like, well, you know, forty dollars doesn't really work, but let's make it forty-five or fifty. You know, it, it you can kind of work around it. Um, I mean, biz, biz, I would say the biggest thing though for me is um, how easy that kind of conversation goes with an artist, because if the artist is, you know, if the artist is on the other end and they're saying, um, no, I will only take this much, I go, ah, okay, well. Maybe, maybe if you're not going to be flexible at all, then maybe maybe you're not the right artist for me, even though I love your work. Mm -hmm. yep, okay. How about you, Liz? What do you think is uh, important regarding negotiating contracts? Neil Gaiman had a commencement speech, uh, I think a year ago, that nailed it, as he often does. He said, you have to have three things. You have to have at least two of three things. You need to be easy to work with, extremely good quality, and I'm going to ban on the third one. Um, the, uh, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, or exactly on time. As long as you have two of those three things, you will get freelance work. You know, if you do average work but you're always on time, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and and um, uh, you're easy, you know, uh, it, it, look up the the commencement speech. His whole speech mm -hmm. as an artist, as a creator, is exceptional. Um, as an artist, I expect to negotiate. I don't expect flat fees. People will come to me and say, first of all, are you busy? That's the for me. That's mm -hmm. the first question. Really? Am I already so booked that I cannot? do work. They say freelancers should never say no. That's not true because if it pushes things off so far that you can't get the work done or you can't get it done professionally, effectively, mm -hmm. then you need, to, you need to say no at times. Um, then we talk price and I expect the, the publisher to say this is our budget. Can you do it for this? And I'll say yes, no, or let's see about making this change. Um, occasions I've been handed a flat fee and when I've come back and said, well, that fee is not really great, can we discuss rights involved? Do I still have the right to use it for other uses, my own use? Do I get to keep copyright? Those things all factor in for me. Mm -hmm. And I think for most artists um, who are working professionally as opposed to, oh my god, I'll do this for the credit, which is never a good idea. <laughs> yeah. that's, uh, that's, that's interesting actually, so I was going to come back to that a bit later. Um, but you, you mentioned about um, reliability being very important. How do you assess that when you're first talking to an artist? There's not really a way for you to just know how reliable anybody is. And even if they're reliable once or twice, there's always instances where things can come up that makes them less reliable. Um, and that's, that's true of any freelancer in any field, really. Um, but I mean, I, what I'll normally do is the first time that I work with an artist, I'll say, well, I need like 10 or 15 pieces, but how about this? I'll give you two pieces. We'll see how quickly you come, uh, how, how quickly they come back. We'll see how well we work together. You know, if you're able to take my, my ideas and construct something good out of them yeah, in the way that I present them, because if you can't, if, if we're not speaking the same language, then it's not worth it. Um, you know, and, and then I'll obviously pay them for those two pieces and then I'll take my other 13 pieces and go find another artist. Um, so, I mean, it, it really is about being just very, um, again, it's, it's all about the relationship. I mean, actually, the, the best part about um, a lot of the artists that I've worked with is that because we've 
it, it, I've treated it like it's a relationship and we've sat down and we've had discussions about things and we talk. Now I talk to them all the time even though they're not working for me and I have a bunch of artist friends now. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really fun that way. Um, but it's, it's, it's just all about getting in each other's heads. You know, it's like, well, if I tell them to do this, they're going to draw that. Okay, cool. Um, I'm sorry, but the question was reliability. Um, but yeah, that's what I normally do is, is I kind of shoot a couple of, of pieces over there and see the, see, see the quality of the work and the turnaround that they give it to me and make sure that they can give it to me um, in the way that I want it. And then if they do, then awesome, then I'll throw them more work. Um, but I mean, it, the, you know, the first thing with the scheduling, there's always schedule things to, to deal with and you have to be as flexible with your schedule, especially if you're trying to get a, uh, an artist that is a well-known artist and has a lot of work you know, with multiple companies. Uh, you have to kind of take your slot in line sometimes. <laughs> Did you concur with that, Liz, or anything else tied to the issue of reliability? Um, I, I was... I had it easy. When I was working for Flying Buffalo, um, we had a magazine, Sorcerer's Apprentice. I would often test drive artists there. Same mm. kind of idea. Here's a small project. Uh, if I couldn't get it done, it meant I could easily fit in somebody else and uh, pick up the slack. I could check their, their reliability and so forth. Um, I, I think the biggest factor every artist and probably every uh, publisher, but certainly the artists need to bear in mind, talk to the uh, publisher while you're working. If you're going to be late, it's much better for you to say, I'm not going to have it for you on Friday, but I'll have it for you Tuesday, than it is to say, mm, I'll send it to them on Tuesday. They'll have to wait for it. This is really, really good. That's all well and good, but sometimes that just doesn't fly. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to use I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, communication in general is going to be better than no communication. I mean, that's just... You, you always want to know something, and even if, you know, and I have... I, I have some artists that are like, you know, if I give them a few pieces, they're like, all right, well, here's a sketch for this one, and I'm going to send the next one to, in about an hour, and here's the next one, <laughs> yes. and I'm just like, and I'm like, okay, like, but yeah. it's cool. You can you can hold on to them and just send them in one email if you want. It's okay. I, you know, I don't need every minute of your progress. Um, but but on the other end, I, I have a, an artist that... Um, that has been incommunicado for months now, um, and they owe me pieces. So Ow. you know, it's like, what am I? You know, what can you do? Really, it's you know, and and that's and again, that's an example of an artist that I did try out. They did good work, and then now the second time I'm using them, they kind of fell off the face. And there's there's ex extenuating circumstances around it, but still, like very very little communication, and it, you know. It, it definitely puts a sour note on an otherwise nice relationship that we had. Yeah, so I'll, I'll... Words, so reliability and communication, I think, for the perspective of artists. Sorry, Liz, you were going to say. I was just going to say that um, the, the Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls project that I mentioned at the top of the run, uh, I am currently the bottleneck. I'm the one not getting the work done. I was I came down with pneumonia this uh, late this spring, and I was basically out of uh, not non-functional for three months. Right. Uh, I wasn't sick that whole time, but I had no energy of sleeping all the time, all the rest of it. Mm. Um, I had artwork to do. I had editing to do. I had writing to do for the project. Everything is three months behind. And I have done my best to put up blog posts, and we've put out Kickstarter updates about this. And I'm back, finally, to working more or less full-time in my freelance with this. But um, that's a three-month stop where I came to a complete crashing halt, and there's not a damn thing I could do about it. Exactly. And, well, and, and you know, and that's kind of the thing is there there are controllable things like... Hey, I just forgot to send that email, and then obviously <laughs> things like pneumonia. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a an eye opener. I'll tell you, I have never been that sick in my adult life. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. Days, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, turning turning back to the to the artist side of things, then, 
Um, if you're a new artist, um, Jonah would like to know um, what what methods are there for effectively showcasing your work if you want to get into the RPG industry? Uh, can I ask Liz that, please? I'll let you answer first this time, Liz, because I've answered first the last couple. Well, no, I was planning on, on you doing that. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, um, in truth, I am a bad person to ask that question of because I do go back so far. I would, I would hate to be trying to break in for the first time now. Um, I have heard horror stories um, from new artists and from even established artists trying to get their work seen. You know, I've had people say, yep, go to DeviantArt, post your material there. Um, I am of the opinion that you should always hold your own art under a location you control your own website, ideally. Um, you know, others say, oh yeah, I sell my stuff on Etsy. Um, other people are spamming the every publisher. They go to the game store, friendly local game store. They go to conventions. They look and see who is putting out products that look like they could take the kind of thing that their artwork would fit. Um, and then find out who the art director is. If the art director is attending something like Gen Con or you know, another large convention, put your portfolio in front of them. You know, the face-to-face -face meetings are great if you can, if you can swing it. Um, I, I've been lucky, uh, you know, even though neither of you knew who I was when we came to this convention, <laughs> this, this convention here, um, on the whole, my name is well enough known or I have enough credits to be able to say, this is what I've done, are you interested in having my work? But I'm also getting a lot of my work from old clients, uh, everything from Mark Miller's Traveler to Tunnels and Trolls, as you held up, um, and uh, Magic. Uh, you know, I'm staying busy with the renaissance of RPG tabletop work, and people grew up with my artwork, so even if they don't know I'm still out here, once they find out, they can go, oh, okay, we can have <laughs> you do some work. I would say in my defense, um, a lot of the things that you do artwork <laughs> for are not are not things that I that I play a sure. lot of. So I mean, I try to keep up on the artists in the games that I play a lot. Um, you just happen to not be in those. So <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm not. Uh, I don't. I don't in any way mean that to to criticize. Um, I I am an old school gamer, and honestly, you know, the the industry is so diverse. Um, I I'll, Confess, I had never heard of Third Eye Games before this, so the, <laughs> you know, the, the ignorance is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Roy, well, I mean, how, how would you say that an artist would do, do best to get the work out of them? Oh, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways. I mean, I, I, um, I do a few different things uh, when I'm looking for a new artist. Uh, and, you know, the strange thing is that I'm going to probably, I'm going to disagree a little bit with Liz. Please. And that the first place that I go to when I'm looking for a new artist is DeviantArt. Um, and it's really just because even though it might be better for the artist to have, um, you know, an art site that they control and, and, and whatnot, um, it's easier for me as someone just looking for ideas and looking for styles to kind of have everything all lumped into one place. Um, so I can go to one website and I can see, you know, hundreds of different styles and hundreds of different artists. Uh, so, I mean, it's really good. And usually I'll just, you know, pop them a little note and I'll say, hey, are you available for commissions if I like their stuff enough? Um, conventions is a good way to do. Um, I've hired a few people from face-to-face -face meetings at conventions. Uh, it doesn't happen too, too often. Um, but I will sometimes also go through artist alleys at conventions and I'll pick up a few cards and see if I can, you know, um, see if I can use any of those artists as well in some of my projects. Um, I picked up one of my favorite artists, um, Amy Ashbaugh, um, that's worked on quite a few of my products at this point. I picked her up from an, an art show. Um, hey, buddy. Can you go. Yeah. You can go back to your room. <laughs> he came out to get a pencil. Um, <laughs> Young artist. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, 
So, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, there's that. Um, I've gotten a... I've, I get, you know, emails from just random artists that sometimes I like them, and I'll send them an email and say, hey, do you want to work with me? Uh, but I would say DeviantArt is probably the main one um, that I use in order to find new artists. And I found some really, really good artists on there, and I have found some very frustrating artists on there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and honestly, if you're somebody, uh, if you're like a, a new publisher or you're just trying to find maybe a few pieces, DeviantArt is probably going to be your best bet. I mean, if you, you know, try to, um, you know, try to track down established artists, they're probably either really busy or they're outside of your price range. Uh, but on DeviantArt, you can usually negotiate some sort of deal. But on that end, but on that end, if you do if you are reading an RPG book and you see some art that you like, go to the credit page and see what artists work on that book and then email those guys. Because, you know, f the thing about freelancers is they're always kind of looking for more work, mm -hmm. even if it's one or two pieces here and there. Okay, so as well as those, those two opinions, um, something that Liz said earlier that I was interested in actually, and, it, and it's also been raised by Phil, who is a who is an artist in um, the RPG field and he's been he's published a couple of pictures, but um, he's asked whether you think it's a good idea for new artists to, to do work for free to get themselves noticed. Liz, you, you think it's such a good idea? Never. Never. If you have spent enough or time, enough hours of your life, another, enough ink, blood, sweat, tears to be of professional quality, you deserve to get paid. Period. Yeah, and, uh, I agree. Um, I have accepted free art when somebody drew an awesome picture and said, hey, I drew this with you in mind. Here you go. You can have it if you want it. And I said, okay, cool. That's awesome. And then I'll usually say, can I give you something for it? Can I give you a free PDF? Or can I a sticker or just something? Can I give you something for it? Because it almost feels like I'm stealing if I don't give something for the art. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, 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 never do free. Never do free. Even if you do it for a dollar, that's not free. <laughs> just yeah, it's, 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 it's a question of self-respect and yeah. expecting respect from yeah. your publisher. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll also add, with virtually no exceptions, don't do the, we'll give you part of the profits, we'll cut you in on the royalties. I have had mm -hmm. that offered countless times. It has worked out precisely once with Magic <laughs> the Gathering, um, in which time I was still paid an upfront fee. This was way before Magic was had hit at all. No one had any idea what it was going to be. And I was offered a, a small amount, 50 bucks for a painting, and a bit of royalties. And I looked at that and I said, I can't do a painting for 50 bucks. And I went away and I thought about it and I said, you know, I want to paint more. They're offering me the opportunity to paint. I will paint for 50 bucks. Anything else that comes afterwards is all gravy. But if they had said, we will only give you royalties, I would not have done it, period. Right. Even though, I mean, I just, I wouldn't. Okay, so how, how, would, a, how would a prospective artist go about uh, pricing or valuing their work if they're a new artist? Um, Roy? <sighs> That's a tough one, honestly. <laughs> it is. That's a tough one. Um, there is an there's an industry standard in the RPG industry, and it's not used by everybody. But you know the industry standard that usually you take and then you jump off of if you want to change it is it's for black and white. It's twenty five dollars for a quarter page piece, which is really small. It's fifty bucks for a half page piece and a hundred dollars for a full page piece. And if it's color, it's usually double. And that's like that's like a good standard to just kind of start off on. Um, some artists are more expensive, and some artists are, are you know are so fast that they're like, 
hey, I'll you know only charge you thirty dollars for these half page pieces because I can just bump out a bunch of them and I'm super fast. Um, you know, some people, different artists are you know have different things. But again, it it, it kind of goes back to um, the thing that Liz had referenced from Neil Gaiman, and he actually said it in a different way than I have actually ever heard it. I had, a, I had it's the triangle of um, what is it? It's good, fast, and yes, uh, that's another way. Yeah, it's it's good, fast, and cheap. cheap. Good, fast, yeah. and cheap. And you can only ever have two. That's okay. the thing. So if it's fast and cheap, it won't be good. If it's fast and good, it won't be cheap. <laughs> if it's good and cheap, it won't be fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's that. That's honestly the that is kind of what you're looking at. So some people value the speed a whole lot, and they're good. So you can, you know, so, or they're cheap, so they won't be as good as other artists that spend a lot of time on it, but you can get them for a little bit cheaper. Um, there's also stock art and stuff like that. I've never yep. personally used stock art, um, but that's an easy way to, to get packs of art that are. RPG art. drive through has clip art, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I don't personally use it because I like to tailor um, every piece in my products mm -hmm. Um, to fit the narrative that's going on right there on that page, um, but a lot of people have success with with clip art. Mm -hmm. That didn't actually that last part was just edit because it came to my mind. That has nothing. Yeah, to no, do. you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's cheap. <laughs> it's cheap and it's quick. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Liz, do you have any advice for for new artists pricing their work? Um. I, for what it's worth, the price uh, industry standard that Eloy has spoken of is the same thing that's been going on for literally 40 years. Artists have never gotten a raise. <laughs> um, yeah, isn't that scary? Isn't that scary? Um, uh, you know, an awful lot of it is what the market can bear, uh, and that's up to the artist to negotiate. Uh, I don't work for that price, for example, <laughs> um, you know, unless it's something I desperately want to do. Right. Uh, that also factors in how much, what, what is the other thing you're getting for doing this project? And this is where I think people fall afoul of that, well, if I do it for free because I really want to work for this project, um, you should still get paid. Uh, right. If they're going to benefit from you, you should benefit from them. That's that's only fair. Um, but uh, the the I tend to ask high initially and expect to negotiate down. That's a horrible giveaway. I'll have to like double my ask is now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> being a, being out in public and admitting this, but um, but that's the only way to find out what you're worth in the market. Yeah. is to set your price at something that you're going to be comfortable at and then add a little more so you can come down to it. Mm. All right, that's, that's, that sort of segues nicely into the next thing I wanted to ask you. Um, another question from Keith, actually. Liz, as an experienced artist and, and, and also a person that's hired artists, um, is there anything else that an artist can bring to the table other than the quality of their work? Um, and you know what? What else can an artist offer um, a, a designer? Um, well, it, okay. So here, here. So when I was writing my game Mermaid Adventures, um, I ha I brought on an artist that I had worked with previously, named Melissa Gay, and she brought a whole other level to the game based on the artwork that she did. So it wasn't just, you know, I said, hey, I want a picture of a mermaid doing this. And she would draw this amazing piece with lots of extra things and lots of personality. And then I would say, well, that's really cool, and I like what you did there. I'm actually going to change what I wrote to reflect what's in your picture. It's, so, I mean, first off, excitement. You, like, if you, you know, working on a project that you're excited about, you're going to put more into the pieces and then they'll end up just, they'll, because art is expressive, it's going to express that. It's going to express that you were excited to do this piece. Um, but honestly, I've, I've worked with other 
artists, and I'll be like, well, here's the concepts that are that I have for the game. Um, I would like to do something like this. And then if they shoot back and they say, well, what if I did something like this and this instead? And I'll be like, ooh, well, that sounds good. Yeah, let's try that instead then. You know, I mean, honestly, the 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 creativeness to be able to, you know, spitball ideas back and forth. I mean, because, you know, as writers and publishers and stuff, we have a certain idea of what we want. Um, I am not an artist, and I would never claim to be an artist. So a lot of the time, if my artists say, I think it would work better if we did this, I will go, uh, let's do that then. <laughs> I would say, you know, my answer to that, I, I would definitely... Uh, echo what you just said. There have been occasions where um, I've been asked to draw a, you know, a, some alien creature or a fantastical creature, and I go, what the hell is the anatomy on this thing? There's no way this could work, but what if, you know, and I remember a traveler project where I literally ended up working with them to build the skeleton and the anatomy, my background is anthropology with a minor in zoology, um, and uh, we ended up making this little critter into a full-blown uh, thing by the time we were done. Um, so that kind of synergy is awesome. The other thing an artist um, can bring to a publisher, potentially, um, is publicity. Uh, if they have, if they're active in social media or on their blogs or on any of the other locations where um, they can say, "Hey, this is the project I'm working on. Get excited about it. I'm I'm excited about this project. Here's a glimpse of something I'm doing, and I just can't stand. I'm having so much fun doing this thing. <laughs> That's good publicity for the for the final uh, project." Yeah. Okay. The enthusiasm, then. yeah. As well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, and and you know, publicity is a big deal. I mean, that and that is part of why you would pay more for an artist. Um, you know, because if you get a DeviantArt person who's new to the industry, then they're going to tell their friends that you know that they're working on this cool art thing. Um, but if you get someone who's been in the industry for 20 years, has a huge following, and you get them for your project, then they're telling their thousands of fans that they're working on this cool new art thing. Um, so, I mean, that is, that, that is part of why you would pay more for an artist um, that has been established and everything. I mean, besides the reliability and the quality of their work and all that stuff, that is just another thing to throw on top of all of that. So I agree. Well, okay, that's, that's quite interesting. You know, you're saying about the, the artists can bring enthusiasm, and, and perhaps you talked about your mermaid adventures that Melissa, um, you know, sort of help, help shape almost. Um, the question that Jonah wants to ask me is: if you've got a designer who who writes some stuff for you, and you don't like it, you proofread it, and you want to change it, then that you know you can change the words around, add a few in there, take a few out there. But as an artist, if you if you if you get a piece from an artist and it's not quite what you want, how do you handle that? Aloy, perhaps I can ask you to answer that one. Well, I mean the, the I mean it's pretty easy. Uh, the contracts that you sign give you a certain amount of time f um, for revisions, um, and usually include one, possibly two revisions for free. If I'm going to be super picky and ask for tons of changes every time, then I have to pay more. Uh, so, um, I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward, like from the get go. It's it's never a um, you know, I'm going to give you a very vague idea of what I want, and then you come back with something, and then I say, no, I want it completely different, and you'll have to change it five or six times before I'm happy, and I won't pay you a dime more. Uh, so, yeah. no, it's definitely, definitely not that way. And in the end, if the artist and the publisher cannot come to an agreement, if it has been an event like that, and I have seen that, I hate to say it, um, where it's like, oh yeah, do whatever, and uh, well, change it, and change it, and change it, um, uh, and it doesn't work out, then there is something called a kill fee, which is usually a third of the final price, um, where you, you, know, you cut bait and, and walk away from each other. Yeah. 
I did. Um, I think three. I think I did three magic cards over the years, for example, that for whatever reason didn't meet what their expectations were. But even though I did fifty or so, you know, you talk about. Let me blip back real briefly to that question about having a relationship with the art director. Mm -hmm. uh, for a while, WOTC was changing art directors once a year whether they needed it or not. It was impossible to build a relationship with an art director because next week it was going to be somebody else and mm -hmm. each of them had different tastes. Right. Um, so you were always starting again from baseline. Um, and uh, there were some of the art directors that uh, I did not get along with. Um, many of them are still friends. So yeah, it, it varies wildly, but um, the bottom line is if the artist has done a substantial amount of work, they deserve to be paid for some of that time. You should not have to pay for something you can't use either, so you should not be paying full price. Well, and that was part of, that kind of goes back to what I said before is I usually do you know, test pieces, mm -hmm. you know, because I want to make sure that I will be able to convey my ideas in a certain way and they will be able to give me what I want. So I don't just jump into a brand new artist and say, well, I need these 20 pieces. I, I need this one piece. Let's make sure we work well together. You know, so Absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's a, it's a big deal. Okay. And that's an interesting question about, about direction there. I mean, as, as, as an artist, Liz, um, what what kind of art direction do you find you work best with? Do you like to be, be given something very prescriptive, or or are you do you prefer to, to to bring your own interpretation to what you're being asked to do? My professional answer is I'll do whatever you ask. If you want to give me mm -hmm. tight art direction, I'll do it. If you want to give me loose art direction, I'll do that. I will say that the most creative and exciting work has always been where I've give, been given a lot of leeway. Um, sometimes it's frustrating because I do like to get some idea of what the people want. But um, uh, to reference another book, um, uh, Daniel Pink has a book called Drive that I heartily recommend anyone in the creative field read. It speaks of mastery, autonomy, and purpose being the things that motivate people. When you have an artist to whom you can give some autonomy, and what they produce. Say, here's a manuscript, I need 20 illustrations spread throughout it. You'll get some probably pretty amazing stuff and probably more than you paid for because they get to put themselves and their creativity into the work. There are people who don't have the professional discipline to do something like that. You need to know that about the artist before you get into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree with that. Uh, <laughs> Um, I would say so what, what, what you, I get very you, loose. You just talk about direction. Well, I'm pretty yeah. loose with my art direction. Um, when I, um, for instance, again, part and, I, and this is actually a, probably the same thing as, as what Liz was just saying. When I was working with Melissa Gay and we were doing Mermaid Adventures, I said I need um, I need a piece for the for the healing section of the the damage rules. I need a picture of a mermaid with like a cast on. Done. And um, she came back to me with a picture of three mermaids with one with lost a tooth and black eye with a thumbs up, one <laughs> with a crutch that had a paper on it, and like all kinds of just amazing stuff. And I was just like, yeah, 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 that was what I was today. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, let's go with your piece. I like that better than what I said. Uh, so, you know, and, and, you know, but again, I trust her. Um, probably I have her and maybe a couple other artists that I work with a lot that really I can throw them a sentence, and I'm fine with usually 99% of what they come back to me with. Um, you know, and I might say, well, you know, I kind of want maybe that little thing changed, and it'll be like, okay, done. Um, but yeah, a lot of autonomy. Um, that's a big deal for me. Uh, whenever I'm whenever I'm working with an artist, I try and give them as much creative leeway. Um, 
but still getting what I need out of it in terms of my story, my setting, you know, things like that. I mean, again, if I'm already talking with you, I'm already negotiating with you, I already see something that I like in your style, and then it's just a matter of whether you can convey what I need out of it. Okay, all right, that's fantastic, thanks. Can we move on and talk about contracts a little bit? Um, just for, for us that aren't in the industry, um, Kate has asked the question, does the contracted art artist retain any rights to the images which you've purchased? Um, Liz, do you want to ask that one? That's part of the negotiation process across okay. the board. The vast majority, for better or worse, of what I've done over the years has been work for hire. Um, that said, I often am able to keep certain rights or um, a time limit on what rights are being given away. Um, I know that many of my fellow artists have had worse luck and some have had better contracts. It all depends on what you negotiate. Sometimes you don't have much leverage. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, so to answer, so my question, I guess, would be for for an artist. Uh, I, I, and I'll ask you, Liz, real quick before I even okay. answer this part of it. Um, so, having the rights to a specific piece, like obviously, if you're working for like Marvel, they own the rights to Spider-Man, no matter how awesome your piece on Spider-Man was. Um, so if you're doing art for a specific setting or a specific, um, you know, thing, you know, like if you were, say, doing um, Vampire the Masquerade, for instance, and you were drawing a signature character of Lucinda, um, is, would you even bring up rights? Because Lucinda is already, a, already theirs, you're, just, you're drawing her, but he, she's already theirs. Is that something you would even bring into a negotiation? I would discuss it, yes. Um, to the extent that the bare minimum that I expect from a publisher is the right to be able to use the artwork to publicize myself. Um, and um, uh, it, that, even from the Tolkien estate, I did a great deal of work for um, the Middle-earth uh, material when it was under Iron Crown, both for the RPG and for the card game. Um, I have pictures of Merry and Pippin and Bilbo and all the rest of it um, that bear no resemblance whatever to the movies because the movies haven't come out yet. Um, and I can print those in portfolios of my own work. I can put them on my website with those names attached um, mm -hmm. and sell the originals with those names attached. They have about the most inflexible, harsh, uh, harsh to the artist, uh, contracts that I had ever dealt with. Um, like I said, that's my bottom line. And uh, frankly, as much as I respect White Wolf and the uh, and Vampire, um, they aren't in that class. So yes, I would I, I would bring it up. <laughs> yes, I would bring it up. <laughs> well, I might, I, mean, not, I might not get it, but I right. would discuss it. Well, I mean, and because what I do with for my for my artist, what I do is is I say, well, I'm going to own these pieces. They're going to go in my game books. and but, but I do allow, I say, you can print them out for your portfolios. You can do prints and sell them. Like, you know, do whatever you want. I mean, you did the art, and that's awesome. Um, you know, put them on your website and, and whatnot. Um, you know, if you can do a nod to my company, maybe have it linked or something, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know? Um, well, that's reasonable. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and, 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 you know, that's what I do. Um, and I and I guess the um, one of yeah. the questions is is fifteen years from now, do you think your company is still going to be publishing that book? Hmm. Don't know. Okay. Can I have the art back if you're not? <laughs> I'd be fine with that. Then yeah, sure. No, I mean, but the thing <laughs> is, is that that's not the way the contracts tend to get written. They tend to right. get written in per in perpetuity. Right. 
Okay. If um, I mean th this is this is probably more another question for the new artists. Um, how reassured should um, new artists feel by by contracts and uh, non-disclosure agreements after they've taken on a job? This. How, how should they feel about contracts? Yeah. And how reassured should they feel about them? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite understand the question either. Okay, um, a non-disclosure agreement. If you if, if you actually um, take on a job, um, the, the non-disclosure agreement, um, should the artist be happy with that? Sure, if that's what they want. I mean, you know, I certainly had to to deal with that in the computer game industry when I was doing storyline development you know, writing the the events and the projects and the puzzles. People think that I did the artwork uh, for compu some computer games that I never have. It's always been writing work. And there is a very hard, sharp NDA uh, on every computer contract I've ever worked on. I can't say that I think I've ever seen one in the RPG industry. They exist, um, but they're, they're unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's really just people thinking that their idea is the best thing ever, and there's nobody else that has ever done anything like it, which is not true in the RPG yeah. industry. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I mean, I would I, they're unnecessary, honestly. NDAs, honestly, in in RPGs, you want people talking about it. You want okay. people to be excited about it. You want them to be excited about it before it's even out. That's a big deal in RPGs because then when it actually is out, um, more people will buy them, and you know that'll turn your small sales into adequate sales. <laughs> <laughs> Better sales. Just say exactly. <laughs> okay. What what advice would the two of you have for for a new artist in the RPG fields? Lloyd, have you got anything in particular that uh, you can share? Oh, that's that's a okay. So that's a broad question. Um, yeah, advice. Um, I, you, you, I can you, offer one that it took me a little while to learn. As was pointed out, speed is of the essence. Often, when you're a freelancer, everything you ever put out will be out there for a very long time. If you push your speed or your quality too hard, at some point you'll either get a product back and you go, I'm not proud of this piece. Or you will have an art director be interested in your pieces and say, but you did this thing five years ago and it's really not that good. I need everything you send me to be better you will always be judged by your worst piece. That's true in a portfolio, <laughs> and that's true in a career. Don't shortchange yourself. Always do the best you can. Oh, fantastic. Can we, but, okay, there's perhaps some, since, since I've, I've, I've got you here, and so you, you know, you've been in the industry as long as you have, what, what first got you into the industry? I mean, what, um, what was your first piece that you sold to a, to a company, for example? Me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I had been part of a fanish group, just a regular science fiction crowd when I was in college. Um, and um, uh, one of the people in that fan group, uh, we, it was the Friday Night Inevitables, we called it. Um, uh, just a bunch of people get together, talk science fiction, uh, old school fanish nonsense. There was a group in the corner that played uh, RPGs. Uh, I'm sorry, they didn't play RPGs because they hadn't been invented yet, mm -hmm. literally. This tells you how old I am. Um, we played Risk and Regatta and Diplomacy and crap like mm -hmm. that. Um, but um, uh, Ken St. Andre was one of the people in that crowd. He um, had was talking with Rick Loomis of Flying Buffalo about um, doing various things that he was constantly inventing. But Rick had said, I have this uh, little, you know, play-by-mail booklet and um, uh, 
for some, I, I want to say starfaring, but it wasn't that. It, it, would, it was something like that. And Ken, in his Kenish way, said, oh, Rick will probably pay you five or ten bucks for that. So I quickly drew up a, a star field, you know, uh, something or other science fiction-y thing, walked up to Rick Loomis's door and said, Ken said you'd pay me ten bucks for this. <laughs> <laughs> I always overpriced myself. And Rick said, um, um, uh, okay. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I'd been in fandom for years, several years at that point, you know, going to science fiction conventions, selling my art at the art. Uh, uh, art shows and things like that. So I knew my stuff was good and saleable, but that was my first game sale, per se. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. And so do you, do you prefer to, to, to paint, uh, draw characters or monsters or scenes? or What's your preferred genre? My preferred... Okay. What I prefer is pushing my... pushing the envelope. I like doing different things. Uh, that said, what I am known for and what I ultimately turn out consistently the best is characters. Individuals, people who you look at and you go, I want to know who that person is. I want to meet that individual. Um, I did tons and tons and tons of city books back in the day. I was for a while... Uh, everybody was so keen on my characters that I was doing endless character portraits until I finally started yelling at my art directors, give me something else to do, I'm getting tired of just drawing faces. <laughs> um, uh, and they let me go back to doing scenes as well as people. But um, ironically, the one thing that I have difficulty is drawing the same person twice. Um, I had talked to one of the people at, at uh, Dark Horse back in the day and um, he said, can you draw to model? And once he explained what that was, being able to draw Batman ten times, or whatever, um, and have it look like Batman, this, you know, the same individual each time, I said, no, I can't do that. Um, and even when I've tried, they always look like slightly different people. I've come to the conclusion that I'm slightly face blind. What that means is that it's... Uh, it's difficult for me to recognize individuals from one occasion to the next. Uh, everybody has a little bit of that. That's why we do some of the, um, uh, you know, that's why we wear tags at conventions so that we go, yeah, right, I, you're, you're Eloy Lysanda, <laughs> you're Simon, hi, I remember you from last year because we'll put those things together. Um, but if you walk up to me, without your badge between one day and the next and you're not wearing your hat, I won't be able to recognize you because I have clicked into the fact that you wear a hat and mm -hmm. if you don't have your hat on, you look different to me. And I draw different people for that same reason. Does that make any sense or I sound like a lunatic? <laughs> no, that, no, that's not a nice person. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, the question of genre actually is something perhaps I can put to a lawyer. If you're, if you're looking for an artist lawyer, you told us um, where you might go, DVD Talk, for example, or, or just publish works. Um, will, you, will you have a particular um, genre in mind? I mean, would you have characters in mind or a scene in mind, um, that kind of artwork, when you're looking for the artist, or would you just go to find somebody who look, looks as though he could work with you? Well, I, I mean, what, when, I, um, when I'm looking for an artist, I usually have an idea of what I'm looking for. Um, because... I have a lot of different game lines, and every one of those game lines uses a different style of art and uses, you know, has different themes and everything. I can kind of jump around and I get to mess around with, with different types of artists that do different things, which is actually really fun. Um, but if I, say, for instance, I was looking for something for the Ninja Crusade, my, my ninja game, um, then I would say, all right, so I'm looking for um, an art style that's, anime inspired but not necessarily anime so I'm looking for a part particular artist that does this kind of thing um, if they can do just characters then that's cool I have pieces that I only need characters uh, this artist also does good backgrounds so I'll maybe throw something that's a scenery kind of thing at that person um, this person does really great weapons so I'll have them do the weapons section I mean so you know it, it's 
it, it is definitely a good thing. You need to be able to showcase what you like doing. Because um, I've, I've looked at a bunch of portfolios where people are like, yeah, that's my piece from like two years ago. I don't really do stuff like that anymore. And I'm just like, well, then why is it in your portfolio? Right. Like, <laughs> you know, put, put stuff, you know, you need to t show me what you want to do for me because uh, then I'll hire you and I'm going to judge you and hire you to do things similar to what you have in your portfolio. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's a big deal. But also, that goes on. That goes for anything that you put online and everything like that. Like on DeviantArt, I will go there, and if I see a bunch of color pieces and no black and whites, then I'm just going to immediately assume that you probably work digitally and you don't do black and whites. Um, so if I need a black and white piece, you're probably not going to be the first person I check into. Mm -hmm. Um, I would check into somebody else that has a lot of really cool black and white pieces on their page. Um, all right, I've rambled enough that I have now forgotten yeah. the question. Well, no, I mean, so, so, <laughs> would you say that a, a new artist, is, is it going to be beneficial to a new artist to do lots of various things that they might that might not be the you know they're, they're, the, the thing they enjoy the most? Um, for example, Liz said she likes to do characters. Um, if if, if a, a new artist was likes doing characters but knew that somebody might be looking for um, a, an artist to do scenes, would, would it be beneficial to them to sort of try and branch out a bit or should they stick to what they're good at? Well, you know, I, I'm a big person with um, trying to push my boundaries as well, like Liz said. Um, I'm always trying to like learn something new or I'm always trying to try something new. Um, and I invite that from my artists, but I would say probably only after I already have a, a relationship with them would I entertain that. Because if you're a brand new artist, I'm gonna use you for what you are, what you're really good at. You know, I mean. So if you're really, really good at character portraits, I'm gonna say, well, I need some character portraits. Let's do this. And then if you come to me the next time and I say I need some more character portraits, and you say, hey, I don't want to do just character portraits. I want to really try out my scenery work. I'd say, let's give you a scenery piece then, you know, and and because because people will the thing about being an art director is you your job is to get the best art for the pieces that you need uh, in the book, not necessarily to help other people experiment with their work. Right. Um, so <laughs> so unless the artist is is insistent um, and they have a really cool idea and they're excited about it. I probably wouldn't bring it up myself. That's just no. my. That's just me. Um, you know, if I had an artist that was like, I really want to try this thing. Can I do it for your book? And I'd be like, Yeah, let's do that. You know, because because like we said earlier, you know, if you're excited about what you're doing, it's going to show in the art. And it's going to come through. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm always a sucker for somebody some for someone's enthusiasm. <laughs> well, there's Absolutely. An artist, there's an artist. Would you would you say that it's beneficial to somebody to in their portfolio have um, examples of things they can do as opposed to things that they enjoy doing and are good at? Yes, you want to, sh you want everything that you can do but nothing you don't want to repeat endlessly, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. You don't want something in there that someone's going to say, hey, this is awesome, I love the way you do landscapes, if you genuinely hate doing landscapes. Um, the you will be judged and you could be hired by the thing you like least. Mm -hmm. um, so you will always want what you do to be in there. If you only put in what you enjoy, I think that's selling yourself short. Um, uh, Eloy is right that it's not his job to make to, to give me latitude um, to expand my envelope if I'm not doing it on my own. Um, I do try and approach virtually every piece I do with what can I do differently, what can I learn, what can I explore with this. And sometimes that requires me pushing the art director a little, saying, hey, there's this technique I've been wanting to try do you mind if I give this particular project that you've asked me for, uh, say, a black and white piece? Let me try it in a sepia tone, or let me try it as a finished graphite, graphite piece in grays. Can you publish it that way, um, as opposed to a straight black and white line 
art. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's not something that is in my portfolio because I haven't done much of it yet. Right. Um, but if I have an established relationship with an art director, that's where that's part of the benefit, both to the publisher and to the artist, to be able to say, I've got this cool idea, or I just learned about doing this kind of thing, or I just you know bought this, yeah, I was just exposed to this new technique or this medium, and I want to experiment with it. Can I do that for your project? That mm -hmm. it, 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 if it if it results in something better, that's all to the good. But your own portfolio should have only what you're willing to be hired for, mm -hmm. and everything okay. you're willing to be hired for. Okay, so that's use, useful advice there if uh, somebody themselves out there. Okay, we we said this is going to be about an hour. It's coming up to the hour mark now. Is there anything that um, I haven't mentioned or asked of the two of you that you think I should have done or that you'd like to add? I, I can't think of anything. I, okay. <laughs> I think we've pretty much covered the gambit. Yeah, okay. quite a lot. I'll just say that the one of the signs I have on my wall that helps me when I really am going, I don't want to do this anymore. Actually, I've got a bunch of signs on my wall because I'm that kind of weirdo. <laughs> um, but bear in mind that if you're going to work in a creative field, it is not always going to be easy. Um, but the question you want to ask yourself whenever you come up against the wall and go, I don't want to do this today, ask yourself how you would feel if you never had the opportunity to do it again. I work extremely hard doing what I love to make sure that I don't have to work extremely hard doing something I hate. Well, that's true for so many walks of life, isn't it? Isn't it, though? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, but thank it's you easy to forget. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much to both of you. It's been absolutely enlightening. and absolutely pleasure to meet you. Um, thank you very much, and I hope that you can um, go back to YouTube and have a look at some of the uh, the other panels that have taken place in virtual con. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for your time. Okay. Thank you very much for asking me. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye. Bye bye.